encouraging to know that that was a church, you know, and that you can have problems like that and still know the Lord and so on. And yet at the same time, it's also a little bit frustrating in the fact that, you know, you see how bad things can get, <laughs> you know, and how bad uh, things can get for people. But I want to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 7. Are you with me? Okay, I need more than that. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. All right, good. All right, good to see you. All right, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no there you go. But we have this treasure, okay? Now, you know, the question is, of course, what treasure do we have? And you know, you're going to get a lot of people's different definitions of what a treasure really is. But the idea of treasure and, and uh, what the treasure is and how to deal with the treasure, I mean, those, are, those are, are other passages in the Bible that we could actually reference. But what is our treasure? The phrase, pressed but not crushed. You can even go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 where when Adam and Eve sinned and God brought a judgment to Adam and Eve and the serpent. There's going to be the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman is going to bite the heel of the seed of the serpent uh, but the, the seed of the woman is going to what? The, the, sorry, I got it backwards. The seed of the serpent is going to bite the heel of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman is going to crush the head. You see? This is one of the things I love about God's Word. Uh, somebody came up to me not too long ago, and they said, you know, we kind of enjoy the, the Dave Masonisms. <laughs> okay? And they started telling me my Dave Masonisms, you know. And it was kind of fun, you know. It was also a little bit humbling, you know, because you're like, oh, really? Okay, well, there you go. So, you know, uh, but the, the one thing about God's Word that is, uh, is beautiful is how absolutely consistent it is. Absolutely consistent it is. So, you know, every time you deal with people, more than one person, you're dealing with difference. You're dealing with uh, different perceptions and different evaluations and so on and so forth. But when you look at the Bible, you see thousands of years and many, 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 many individuals, and yet they all come up with the same reality. That's, an, that's a beautiful thing. That is an absolutely beautiful thing. And so I want you to understand this, this treasure, okay? This treasure, and this treasure is in jars of clay. In jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to... Are you with me? Who's it belong to? God. And who doesn't it belong to? Us. Um, I have most certainly helped a lot of people... Be aware of and apply the prayer of serenity in these recent times. You know why? Everybody's. <laughs> uh, we're a smaller group. You can answer now. <laughs> okay. Why? Because, you see, the prayer of serenity begins with understanding who I am and who I'm not. And I've always lived by the phrase, there is a God and I'm not him. And last week we dealt with the, the, the phrase that I love out of Hebrews chapter 12, God shakes what can be shaken, so that which cannot be shaken, what? Will remain. And so, <clears throat> this treasure is in jars of clay. Now, those jars of clay are basically you and me. We are human beings. You okay? 
Okay, I didn't know something was wrong with the live feed. But anyway, so, you know, the jars of clay. So guess what? This body is always breaking down. Amen? There is an entire, entire industry built on trying to keep me from breaking too far down. And so, you know, th we have to remember, this is clay. This is clay. What, I, what am I at the very basic? I am a soul inhabiting a dirt body. Now, you can break it down chemically, and you can come up with all the molecules and the chemistry and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is, is that I'm dirt. And when this body is done, I'm not done. What's done? The body. The body. So remember that. <clears throat> and so in this passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he's talking about the treasure and the fact that the treasure in the clay reveals who's actually in charge. What the actual treasure is. Boy, I'll tell you what. The power belongs to God, doesn't it? So, you know, one of the things that, um, that I notice is that everybody has a lot of different opinions about what's going on and how to deal with it. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of divisions and conflict. And part of it is, is because we're all trying to gain some sense of control and power. But the fact is, is that neither you or I are in control or have the power. I was talking to two different people. And uh, one of them mows grass. And I said, uh, have you enjoyed all the rain? <laughs> and they said, yes and no. <laughs> you know, because what does rain do to grass? Makes it grow. Okay. But what is this person's business? Mowing grass, you see. Mowing grass. And I said, you know, I've noticed that when it comes to people who deal with nature, that they have a tendency to love it and hate it at the same time. You know why? They can't control it. They can't control it. So notice in this passage, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us goes on to say, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Now, I want you to see this treasure. I want you to understand what this treasure actually is. The treasure is the gospel. The treasure is the gospel. The gospel is indestructible. Indestructible. You cannot destroy the gospel. The reality that Jesus Christ died, buried, and what? Rose again. Now, everybody likes the resurrection. There's not a lot of people that like the cross. Boy, you got all kinds of people that are trying to Divorce the cross from the message of Christianity. But you can't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot get away from death and burial and get to the resurrection. Peter tried it. Remember what he said to Jesus? Don't go there. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Something you should not say to your spouse, but get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Anything that stood in the way of the gospel, 
Jesus got real involved with. He didn't mind getting physical and he didn't mind getting rough with anything that stood in the way of the gospel. When the money changers filled the temple and were charging people excessive amounts of exchange and making it necessary for them to do that, what did Jesus do? He made a whip and drove them out. He made a whip and drove them out. And so I want you to understand this. The gospel is the treasure. The gospel is the treasure. And it doesn't matter what you have to face or what you have to go through to deal with that treasure. You always keep the gospel. You always keep the gospel. I remember when I first faced this, I was sharing Christ with a guy up on Capitol Hill in, in downtown Denver, right in front of the Capitol. The Capitol sort of has a, an approach up to it. It's a little bit raised. And I was sharing with a guy, and he got kind of upset with me because I was talking to him about Jesus. And he said, if you say one more word about Jesus, I'm going to punch you straight in the face. Well, he's a man of his word. <laughs> and because I got a German schnauzer, you know, and it bleeds easy, you know, uh, you, you know, it got rough for a minute. What are you willing to do for the gospel? What, what would it take to drive you away from the gospel? I will tell you, it doesn't always work out like this, but it did that time. That gentleman ended up being a pastor's son. I was just a brand new Christian. I, I didn't understand everything. I still don't understand everything, but I know a lot more. And when we got done, he was crying and praying. And I was still bleeding. <laughs> but eventually I quit. And so I want you to understand this. I want you to get this. I want you, to, I want you to, to genuinely grasp the understanding of treasure that lasts and clay that passes away. And how it reveals the power of real life, what the real power of life actually is. And so it goes on to say, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but what? Not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. You see how you can't get away from this? Carrying in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So you can't get the resurrection without the cross and burial. No one can. So you have a lot of people today, they just, they just say there is no hell. Or they say everybody goes to heaven. Or they take away anything as sin. There is no sin. You just do whatever you want to and you're going to be okay. Either way... What they're actually doing is they're taking away the cross and the burial and trying to get to the resurrection. How many of you have dessert before you eat your meal? Sometimes. <laughs> it is what it is. How, how many of you actually have the dessert and skip the meal? <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey, baby. Eat that sugar, because that sugar is good, ain't it? You know. Now, I'm kind of strange. Baby lima beans with butter and salt on them are like a dessert to me. Now, isn't that weird? Yeah, that's weird. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, we all have our sweet. We all have our dessert. We all have our things. And remember this. Nothing can take the dessert away from you. Nothing can take the gospel away from you. There is nothing that can take the work of God out of your life. 
when it's actually the work of God. Because the power of God is complete and sufficient all the way through. So he, he talks about this, this fact that in their body is the death of Jesus, but also the life of Jesus is being manifested. Because even though that we have been pressed, we're not crushed. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our, what is it? Mortal bodies. Mortal bodies. They don't last. The flesh does not last. You ever back a horse that didn't make it? And that's just a phrase. I'm not asking if you bet on racing horses. But I got such a kick out of my grandma, Mason. She was such a teetotaling Methodist, you know what I mean? And she was a hard worker, and she had her own business, and so on and so forth. But she started dating this guy. <laughs> and uh, I asked her, I was like, so where do you guys go? Well, we go to that track. <laughs> You know, and so he would take her to horse racing or dog racing, which is north of Denver, up off of I-25. And uh, I just thought that was so funny, you know. But, uh, you know, love does weird things to people. So the reality is, is that we have this mortal flesh. The flesh does not last. Amen. Uh, I just found out, you know, the guy down at Dearborn that won the $300 million in a lottery. Do you remember him? No? Some do, some don't. He just died two years ago. Died at age 59. Guess how much of that money he took with him? None. He wasn't interested in taking it with him anyway. He was one of the few guys, few families, few people that actually did what you should do, and that is give it away, benefit other people. Because the bottom line is, is that it doesn't make you okay. It doesn't make you okay. As a matter of fact, the lottery ruins most people. It doesn't help most people. But again, flesh, what? Passes away. But what lives forever? The spirit. The spirit. The soul. And so you have to understand what you're actually, what you're actually putting your confidence, you're actually putting your heart, what you actually consider to be your treasure. What is your treasure? He goes on to say, so death is at work in us, but life in you. So now he's saying, look, we're dying to bring you the gospel. And our bodies are being actually harmed in many ways. Our lives are being harmed in many ways. But that's okay. Why? Because you're getting the treasure. We've got the treasure and we carry the treasure in these clay pots so that you can have the treasure. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. And bring us into his presence. So, the one thing about salvation is that it is present active. Present active. Yes, we are saved, but we are continuing to be what? Saved. Until the completion. And as you go along with that, it's being tested all the time. It's being tested all the time. What would it take for you to give up Jesus Christ? Now don't just pass by that. What would it take? The girls sang Amazing Grace. That was a fella who destroyed thousands upon thousands of lives believing that some humans were not human. 
but he found grace. You couldn't get John Newton to give up Jesus Christ for nothing in the world. But he sure gave up the slave trade, didn't he? This is what we understand, that this is what the gospel is really all about. This is understanding of how you, uh, how you actually keep and follow the treasure. Knowing that he who has raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends more to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. This is what I talked about last week. I talk about it often because I find that many people lose heart. Many people give up. Many people give in. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is what? Wasting away. Wasting away. How many of you know growing older is wasting away? How many of you know growing older is wasting away? How many of you have looked at the pictures of other people and said, oh, the years have not been good? <laughs> Amen? And we got, you know, you got these people that are in the image world, and they're working all the time to try and keep their... The, the, the test of time from affecting them, and they got the weirdest faces in the world, don't they? I mean, they got these lips that looks more like the, the you know, the Batman movie, you know, the, and the Joker and so on. And I'm not putting anybody down. I just simply want to say they're trying to keep something that ain't going to work. Are they not? And so the reality for you and me is that, yes, this outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Every morning, the sun rises and it's a new day. Every morning, the world over is given what? A new day. A new day. Notice verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is what? Preparing us. The most important thing that you need to know about testing PVC pipe and fittings with air is not to ever, 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 under any circumstances, do it. If you don't need to know why, feel free to skip the rest of this. Air is compressible which means when you put it under pressure, it stores energy the exact same way a bomb does. And when it lets go, not only does air testing run the risk of damaging property, maiming, or even killing someone, it's a bad test, and for two reasons. One, let's say your pipe doesn't explode, but reveals a leak somewhere. Air pressure doesn't show you where, Unless, of course, you put your head really close to a potentially explosive piece of pipe and you happen to hear a leak. If you test with water, you have immediate visual confirmation of where your piping system needs repair. So, yesterday I was having quite a day. I mean, it was just quite a day. I don't want to go all into it, but I'm telling you, I'd had a really bad night and a, and a very difficult day. And right in the middle of that day, I turned on the pump to my pool, which my experience with pools is that it's very important if you don't want to have a what? An algae pond, <laughs> okay? I turned on the pump to my pool, and guess what happened? This supply line, boom! Huh? I didn't air test it, that's right. I should have put my face right in front of it so I could, okay? I looked over there and I saw, you know, literally gallons and gallons of water going where? All around, yeah, just going, 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 all right? Now, uh, my grands were at the house and they were going to swim. 
So now I have a problem because the pool's going to drain. Because this hose is what? Broken. No good. What made this hose break? The pressure of the water to actually pull and put back and to filter. Okay? It revealed it. Now, when did this line get bad? Well, it's been getting bad over a period of time. But yesterday it revealed it. Praise God. By the grace of God, I kept another line from another pool in one of my boxes. And I went out and replaced it. Isn't that neat? Don't you just love the grace of God? <laughs> my pool was forgiven. <laughs> Amen. But I'm telling you what, uh, now I did not cuss, all right? But I did not bless the pool when I saw that line come apart. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't like, oh, so thank you, dear Jesus. That's really nice. I thank you for doing that. I'm so glad this is happening. So, you know, um, it took a minute. It took a minute. And that's the reality. And I want us to understand this, okay? So what is this affliction? Not just the one we're doing right now, but the afflictions of life. The afflictions of life. Remember, follow the consistency of Scripture. So 2 Corinthians actually talks about affliction in chapter 1. That we are all afflicted. All of us are afflicted. All of us. But this affliction, this momentary affliction, is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are what? Unseen. Unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. The clay is transient, but the treasure is what? Eternal. Eternal. So I want you to think about this for a minute, because all through the book of 2 Corinthians and Corinthians, you'll find this comparison. Notice this, okay? The believer's apparent temporal defeat. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. Chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 10. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, my spirit was not at rest. Verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. The apparent defeat, but the actual what? Victory. Spiritual victory. Spiritual victory. Everyone can struggle with general fear and anxiety, but anxiety becomes disordered when it occurs to the point of disabling one's ability to function in life. The symptoms of anxiety include an inability to relax, tense feelings, rapid heartbeat, increased blood pressure, dry mouth, excessive perspiring, jumpiness or feeling faint, feeling clammy, constant anticipation of trouble, and constant feelings of uneasiness. Anxiety can be triggered by negative thinking. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is effective at helping address thoughts that cause anxiety. The anterior cingulate cortex is the part of the brain that helps regulate fear. A study showed that meditating on a God of love resulted in growth of the anterior cingulate cortex and helped participants manage and diminish anxiety. So what are some action steps? Take an inventory of your triggers. Note what events tend to spike your anxiety and how you respond. Find a counselor who specializes in treating anxiety, specifically a counselor who uses CBT. Working with a counselor or using a workbook on CBT can help you focus on identifying thoughts that spike your anxiety. It can help you develop positive patterns of thinking that are realistic, rational, and redemptive. So notice, 
even though that's cast in a therapeutic counseling you know, language, the reality is how do you solve all those things that are perplexing, afflicting, difficult? You answer them with the truth. You answer them with the truth. The truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Free from what? Free from flesh and sin. Free from what actually ails us. Um, have you ever noticed how many of these uh, pastors seem to be falling by the wayside, especially of these large mega churches? I, I'm not going to go through the list because it would look like I was, you know, standing on people's problems and, and, and glorying in it. That's not it. But I can just tell you this. When you build a life off of self-gratification, it will not work and it will not last and you will fail. Our whole society is built off of self-gratification. Our whole society, our whole world culture. Okay, we got a world culture now. It's all built on what? Self-gratification. The gospel is not about self-gratification. The gospel about it is, is what's true. It's about actually solving the problem of sin and separation from our Creator. And that does not bring always what? Self-gratification. Um, have any of you been pregnant? Wes, don't deny it. So, you know, being pregnant is a painful deal, okay? Um, but what happens at the end with a lot of ladies? Yeah, and then a few years later, they forget all about it and do it again, you know? Uh, and the reality is this, is that life is like that. Life is like that. The most beautiful things all take a lot of pain. They take a lot of pain. So notice again here, the believer's apparent defeat. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair. Many in that passage all seeing apparent but the actual Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, the actual victory. And this is important to understand. For your sake, we were killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 30, this is Romans chapter 8. Yet in all these things, we are more than what? Conquerors through him who loved us. And so there's the apparent and there's the actual. And then at the latter part of the book, in chapter 12, it says, A thorn was given in the flesh, given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to what? Harass me. To keep me from becoming conceited. You take every megachurch pastor that's fallen, every one of them becomes conceited. They believe in their salary. They believe in the people that are listening to them and their popularity, popularity, and they end up losing it all. It's nothing more than behind the music or a drug dealer or drug addict, you know. There's a high and then there's a low. The Bible shows us that the actual victory is, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. What's wrong with weakness? We're not in control. We're not in control. It is very scary to let go of the wheel. 
and just let her go? Where is that going to go? It's not good in a car, but it's good in your spiritual life to do that, to let go. I just want you to understand something today. We are not believers because it's popular. We are not believers because it's easy. We are not believers because we get what we want. We are believers because it's true. Because it's true. That God is God and that his son is the Christ. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus in repentance and confession and faith. That's the only way. So notice what it says in this latter part. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. What is it that actually makes life enjoyable? What is it that makes, you know, well, it's actually the unseen things. You guys have friends? How many of you have friends? Okay, great. What makes them your friend? They pay you a lot of money? Huh? How much is your friend paying you to be their friend? Huh? You want a regular salary or is it just according to how well you do with them that week? No, of course not. You're friends because you're connected in the spirit. Relationship. All the things that you cannot measure. How do you measure love? You can't. But we know it, and without it, we're in big trouble. We know it, and without it, we're in big trouble. It's important for you and I to understand, we do not serve the things that are seen. We serve the things that are what? Unseen. Unseen. And this is important for you and I. So, you know, what's going on is a pressure test. This is a pressure test. You remember when they used to say, this is a test of the National Emergency Broadcasting System. This is only a test, you know. Remember when they used to come over on the TV, you know, comes over on the radio, <laughs> You know, nasty noises, you know, to get us to what? Yeah, to be prepared. I want you to know that this is a test that's going on right now. Now, you can see the tomb of Jesus Christ. But when you look through the opening, what do you see? A cross. Can't have one without the other. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without Denying yourself, taking up the cross, and following him. In his death, burial, and one day, our resurrection. We are not here today, and we are not professing Christ for temporal things. We believe our eternal God and his eternal salvation. You may or may not understand this. But that's the kerygma. That is the centerpiece of the church. That is the core of the kernel. That is the absolute, absolute core. And notice what it says. We preach Christ. What? Crucified. So my friends, I just want to encourage us today. Yes, we're pressed. But we're not crushed. We're pressed, but we're not crushed. God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. 
God is God. And just because you feel out of control, it doesn't mean that God isn't working. I remind myself of that every single day. Every single day. Do you know how often I want to quit being a pastor? Right now, about every day. <laughs> you know? But I didn't become a pastor. I was called to this. And my wife, you know, I tell my wife, I say, well, give me one reason to keep doing it. <laughs> she said, God, God called you. I'm like, oh, I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> you know? But again, it's being pressure test, isn't it? It's being pressure test. My friends, don't grow weary, don't lose heart. We have the truth, and the truth has us. And no matter what happens, God will always fix that pipe. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ, if you have never abandoned your life and been baptized as a believer, if you have never turned over your life to Jesus Christ, I'd encourage you to do that today. If you have Christ and you have given your life to Christ and you have joined to Christ, I encourage you today not to quit. And if you have it going on, 